Hello Hello. and welcome everyone. I hope you can hear me fine with no echoes. So welcome again to MISIS 2021 and I hope uh, you've been enjoying the session so far. I have been enjoying myself. So I am Atita Arora and I work and lead the search team at My Toys and uh, I will be hosting the lightning talk session tonight. So lightning talk by principle are the small five to 10 minutes talk to express and expose the cool and you know fascinating ideas. So that's how it is by principle. And on that note, I would like to welcome our first talk uh, from Lucky Sharma. The, store, the stage is all yours, Lucky. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, let me share my screen as well. Uh, so basically, the idea of Arion, I give a gist of this thing in uh, Burden Buzzwords Barcamp. So the idea is more around, uh, so I worked around Fudlar, but this is this could be search engine agnostic. So earlier to this, I presented the search solar cloud uh, manager, which basically creates or uh, manages your solar cloud independent of solar. And this idea comes in my mind, uh, like the Aerion, I named it because of some Greek mythology. And, and Aerion is basically to solve the problem sitting with people generally when they are trying to use, to, uh, use a search engine or so. So one of the problem statements put here is that whenever we need any new schema change or whenever trying to basically uh, initialize a new solar core or an elastic core they basically uh, put these mappings into search engine and then they be trying so it, there's a hidden trial going on at that point of time where to tweak their tweak their um, analysis chain and to figure out that how generating rate to update what are the things you need to do before actually putting this thing into production so this thing uh, is good for uh, so this is an idea for that part. Also, it will help the newcomers where are new people and uh, if they want to basically try to uh, add new thing and don't know about the analyzers present within that specific version of Solar or Elasticsearch. So this gives the find out like what are the things present and how easily it can be basically propagated to from your uh, Solar from from your area on to production clusters. So as I said, the uh, statement is that what I defined for the capabilities what are uh, basically it in a solar core we can fix across the clusters using cloud manager. It basically a single interface where you can basically update, try and create new schema config. And this could be like then propagated to your search engines. And the other thing is it gives you the uh, gives all possible option analyzers. Like analyzer consists of multiple uh, parameters which people are unaware of at times. But, so they have to go through implementation. Instead of doing that, just use area on UI and try to use. Then you can also basically. Like your internet connection is very weak. Could you maybe please turn off your video to save bandwidth? Sure, 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 sure. Just give me a moment. Is it better now? It seems so, yeah. Hello. Okay. So, okay. So, the, yeah, fourth thing is the version of schema. So, basically, which I've seen after all that people used to score uh, these schema in GitHub or they just put them in files. But the idea behind any schema is basically that. Or engine, baby, have so it will of the uh, schema files and your previous like how your data will go in. So that provides when versus page and see how much, and then Elastic has this analyze API where you can basically try on Postman and see how your tokens is going to work. So, and uh, last, last on the least, it basically makes you. It makes it easy for everyone to create schema. Like, in the, like you can say that I have, and using that. 
I'm afraid we lost Lucky, right? Oh, okay. So I guess um, on that note, I can request my next uh, uh, speaker. So uh, we do have some good comments. I hope Lucky joins back and sees. Uh, and I am particularly pretty, um, you know, happy to see that how this has evolved and so does uh, Eric also feel so because I think uh, it was last year that uh, he presented this idea at uh, Berlin Buzzword Lightning Talk. I was the one who was hosting it. So I'm pretty excited to see like how this has evolved. So I hope he comes back and uh, see some good comments about it. But uh, nevertheless, I'll uh, welcome the second uh, participant uh, on our um, Lightning Talks. That's uh, Roy Krawoski with the, the Usearch Contextual Graph and its application to e-commerce search. Let's see what he ah. has to present. Hi. Uh, thank, hey, always a pleasure. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Just one second. Here it is, sorry for that. So do you see my screen? Perfect. So I'm gonna talk about um, our contextual graph. So Usearch is an internet search company and I would like to show you our contextual graph and its application to e-commerce search. I will try to do it uh, as entertainment entertaining as I can. So we know that a common method to organize knowledge is to classify, give an entity into an underlying taxonomy. So a typical taxonomy can have thousands of uh, categories, possibly arranged in a hierarchical way. And if, for example, we look at night, you know, we know that my night can be mapped to shoes, sporting goods, running, basketball. But if you think about it, this is only half of the picture. And if you ask someone what pops into his mind when he hears the name uh, Nike, he would, he would mention a completely different set of association. He would likely say Air Max or Cortez or Adidas or LeBron James. Now the set of associations in the upper part are very different in nature from the set of association in the lower part. As you can see, the upper part is very static. It's categorical while the lower part is highly dynamic. And for example, the relation between Nike and LeBron James was created only recently uh, once LeBron James signed the contract with Nike. So the main question is how can we differentiate or distinguish between those, um, between categories and contexts? So to understand that, let's make a simple experimental thought. If you ask a random group of people, what pops into their mind when they hear the, the word Nike? So you will see that 50% of the people will say shoes. But if you will go the other way around and ask random people, random group of people, okay, what pops to your mind when you hear shoes? Only few would say Nike. The chances that someone will say Nike from all the sports uh, companies in the world is quite slow. And this is what characterizes a taxonomical relation. It's, it's, it's dominated by a single edge. Now, if we continue with the experimental thought, you would see that 30% of the people will say Air Max. And if you go the other way around, 90% of the people will say Nike when they hear Air Max. And this is what characterizes contextual relation. These are two entities that are bind together, they are contextually associated, they are glued together in our brain. So at user, what we did, we built a large contextual graph based on the World Wide Web. So this is an example of our graph. When you see a sub, a part of the neighborhood around Nike, 
the yellow vertices are categories, the green vertices are the context or the contextual associations, and the scores on the edges represents the probability that someone will think of a given of a certain entity given another entity. The higher the scores, the more contextually associated the entities are. So what we build, we build a, a huge contextual graph. We analyzed 5 billion web pages. The contextual graph has 10 billion entities. It has 300 billion edges. And every day already we are, we are getting 10 million new entities to our system. Now the size of this contextual graph is overwhelming and it's not surprising because everything can be an entity in the graph, any city, any book, any shoe, any restaurant, anything can be a context of something. So having this power of huge contextual graph, let's see how we can, um, how it support and help us to support an internet search engine. And let me show you some example for an e-commerce um, um, applications. So suppose that I have a user and the user is, is entered the word GTA. Now, of course, as a search engine, we have to understand that we have to know the right synonym and acronyms for every search query. So if a user enters GTA, on the right block here, you can see all the similar queries to GTA. And now if you look at the first row, you see that the query Grand Theft Auto is highly contextually associated to GTA and it's 70%. And this is not surprising because GTA is a video game, Grand Theft Auto is the video game, and they refer to exactly the same video game. But this also means that if you mistakenly try to, to replace GTA with another acronym, say Greater Toronto Area, with almost 100% of probability, you will show irrelevant results to the user. Um, let's take another example. If a user enters the search engine gone win, we know as the humans that he means 100% to the movie gone with the wind. And you can see from our contextual graph that gone wind is connected to the vertex gone with the wind and the connects it is 100%. So anytime a user enters the word gone wind, we know exactly that he means the query gone with the wind 100%, it's unambiguous. But many times the query can be ambiguous. So let's suppose that the a user enters into the system the query don't PS4. Now a good search engines have to know exactly what the user mean. I have to predict, I have to predict the intent. So there are few possibilities to understand what it means. So it can be either the video game Horizon Zero Dawn for the PS4 console, either Until Dawn for the PS console, or Far Cry New Dawn for the PS console, and these are the most probable choices. And now as a search engine, we have to understand, we have to predict all, the, the, all those interpretations in order to retrieve the relevant results. And then we have to sure that we are showing the results and the, with the right diversity. Now, if you will try the exact same query on Google, you will see that this is exactly what Google does and show you the exact same diversity of results. And it's not really surprising because compare, comparing our contextual graph with um, real data from Google, we see that the similarity is astonishing. It means that we can really synthesize and generate data that is really identical to a, to, to, to a real user. And with this contextual graph, this contextual graph supports our search engine. And what we are really seeing that contextual graph give us really this cognitive capabilities and, cogni and, and, and prediction to really predict the user intent and understand the right probabilities for every possible interpretations. Yeah, that's from my side. Yeah, that was pretty Fascinating, I would say. I mean, at least, uh, uh, at least from uh, the point of view, as you compared your results with Google, I mean, it looks like you're doing something really fascinating. Although I do have one question. I'm not. Uh, I am seeing one question from Renee, but I would like to proceed with one question from my side first because I am understanding con context as topicality. I believe. 
I think uh, that's what you meant with the context in, in this uh, uh, scenario. No, we, we completely differentiate con context from topicality. So for example, Taylor Swift can be consumed in the context of Britney Spears of Katy Perry. But from mm -hmm. a topic, topical point of view, Taylor Swift is a singer, is in music. For us, as, um, as a, when we are building a search engine, those categories and topicals, they're not really interesting. When I'm plugging into a search engine GTA game or just GTA, I don't need this game. I don't need the topic. I don't, it's redundant for me. We don't need it. But if I will put some other context to a GTA, which is video game, like GTA San Andreas or GTA uh, Vice City, now it gives me another, con another context to a layer to my game. So what we are claiming is that categories, taxonomies, ontologies out. They are not contextual. We don't want them. In most cases, context and those contextual associations that, OK, someone is thinking of LeBron James. They signed the contract. They will think of Nike. I will show you a Nike. I will show you a Nike shoes advertisement. Or someone is thinking of PlayStation 4, and now there is a new version of Xbox. I know that they are both they are both competing. I will show you another advertisement. Okay. So it's these magical contextual associations that we are looking. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for clarifying that. That that helps. Um, on this note, I would take the next question from Renee. Uh, as I understand, the knowledge graph is kind of word knowledge graph. How would uh, you deal with cases where users users of the given search would make slightly different association? So we build a contextual graph and on top, and, and the graph is sophisticated in the sense that it supports what is called query completion and query separation. So there is a layer of similarity. And once we have a user, when we have a query, we are trying to, uh, we are using similarity techniques to try to get with this query as close as possible to queries that are in our log and we know that they are well performing. So getting from a certain query to another, that's really an art because there is a lot of synonyms that you have to make and they have to be contextual synonym. You have to make sure that you're not getting out of context. And th there is a lot of uh, similarity metrics and distances and heuristics that you have to make in order to take you from something you haven't seen into something that you did see, that, that, you, that you saw, and that you know that is likely to be what a user uh, is looking for. Okay, cool. Uh, next question is from Lucian. Uh, how does you search work? Uh, do you actually index all the data on the internet or delegate the search query to Google or Bing or some other search We are engine? completely independent. We have never used any other search provider. We have never used a single search from Google or Bing. Everything is indexed in the house. We have been building the technology over the last five years. We currently have 5 billion web pages in English. Google has 20 billion. We are smaller than Google. Um, we are not yet as qualitative as Google, but all the data is ours. We generate the data with our generative models and have never used any single uh, a search engine. It's extremely important to us to be completely independent and to be completely private. By the way, everything you saw, all the contextual graph is AI generated. Nothing here is collected. Not a single query was collected. Everything is AI generated. So we are working on privacy. We want to get rid of data collection. We have no choice to succeed if we have to collect data. We won't be able to compete with, with Google and being in data collection. So it's, it was out of the question. And we have to be completely independent if we really want to develop a, a solid technology. Wow, that's fascinating. Uh, we have one more question from AC. Uh, how are the edges created? And are the edges weight equal to probability show in the augmented query slide? So um, the underlying algorithm is what is called associative memory networks. It's uh, elements that are taken from neuroscience that we are trying to predict what a user will encode seeing a web page, what a user, for example, might, might encode or recall from the association. So basically, we are analyzing huge amount of billion of web pages, a lot of pattern recognition and statistical pattern recognition, trying to extract the right entity, the engrams, and then the algorithm, and that's the art, is really to predict the score on the edges, because the score on the edges is the most important stuff for us uh, that, and give us the confidence that we know 
where to take a given query. So if, if, if you want to read more about it, then you have to go to auto-associative memory networks. Sure, thank you for answering that. Roy, uh, please do leave uh, some uh, uh, offline references in the chat, if you can. That would yeah, really yeah. help. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and I would say that we move on to our next speaker on this note. Uh, and we have the next speaker as uh, Xavier Sanchez, who will be speaking about Spanish stemmers for solar. Hello, let me share my, my screen. Uh, sure. Okay. Well, I'm going. Uh, hello, my name is Xavier Sanchez Loro. I'm from Wallapop. I'm a search engineer there. And I'm making a little talk about the Spanish stemmers for the solar. Well, uh, sorry. yeah, the idea is just to review all the available implementations in solar right now, and also present a new implementation that we have done, that it's an stemmer just for Spanish plurals. Also, I will show some differences of the different stemmers in action, and finally, some general guidelines on how to use them. Well, which are the current solar implementations? Well, we have the Spanish stemmer. It's the classical snowball-based stemmer. This is a general purpose stemmer. So it stems plural, singular forms, masculine, feminine, verbal forms, and all kinds of, of words. So it's quite uh, aggressive. OK. It can increase a lot your recall, but the precision can be drastically reduced. So you would see lots of collisions between words. And in this case, it's something when you want to increase recall at the cost of, of precision. OK. Well, there is some mean minor things that it cannot stem like words of foreign origin this is something i will show afterwards the next implementation is the spanish light stemmer in this case is an algorithmic approach and this is designed just for uh, stemming singular forms and feminines uh, and masculines to the same root in this case you will increase the, the recall but the precision, depending on the use case or your information need can be quickly reduced, okay? And in this case, uh, the, the usage is when you want a, a distinction between, sing, uh, when you don't want the distinction between singular and plural, and also when the gender is, is not relevant. In this case, it also has the same issue with the plural words from foreign, foreign origin. And also you will see some kind of collisions between words with different really with a really different meaning. In this case, for example, caro y cara, which uh, caro could be expensive and cara could be expensive in the feminine, but could, could be also face. So you could have really different uh, results. Also things like barra, which is a bar, or barro, which is mood, they, they can show really different. Uh, results just with the with the same keyword. In our case, uh, we don't want stemming plural, singular, and also gender. So we just want a collapse singular and plurals, uh, and still distinguishing between masculine and feminine forms. So uh, we thought that we need a new stemmer only for plurals. And in this case, I will show you our implementation, which is the Spanish plural stemmer. Uh, in this case, it's also an algorithmic approach. Well, here you have where we got the, the rules. It's designed only to stem plural and singular forms. So we distinguish between masculine and feminine forms. Uh, here it's, it's the same. It will increase the recall. And depending on the use case, your precision can be, can be reduced. It's able to stem plural words of foreign origin, like punks, beats, robots, and things like that. It also provides support for invariant words. I mean, words where the plural and singular from it's the same or it doesn't make sense, like crisis, jueves, and things like that. Uh, okay. And also we have some support for special cases. There are some cases that are not covered by the regular rules. And in this case, uh, the use case is when you want to distinguish between uh, with gender, but you don't want to distinguish between singular and plural. 
Uh, one of the nice things it, that is that it always produces meaningful tokens in, in, in singular form. So there is no strange stems that are not real words. And we are uh, we are preparing it to be released to the Lucene and Solar community if we see that there is interest on it. So now I will show you how they how they behave in in React with real examples. So for example, if you pick a word like access, which is, is a short plural word. In this case, the other stemmers uh, they don't stem words that are less than five characters, so they miss some, some words. Uh, in this case, also things like a surprise, which is a, a, a foreign word, uh, they, they are not able to, to stem it, so the, the, the token is not changed. But in, in our case, uh, we are able to change it to the real singular form, so we change the, the I for a Y. Also, we are able to, to stem things like comics, which is a foreign uh, origin plural. In this case, the singular is comics, so we are able to do it. And then uh, in cases like camisas, which is a plural, it's a feminine, and there is no masculine word. Uh, in this case, if you see the other stemmers produces tokens that are not real words, and we are producing camisa, which is the, the real singular. And then uh, other kind of plurals like paths. In this case, the Spanish stemmer uh, creates something that is uh, not a, a, a human word. And in and this case, it uh, could uh, have lots of collisions with names like Paco and things like that. And in the Spanish latest stemmer and, and the plural stemmer are able to generate the correct, the correct uh, singular form, which is that you change this C by, by a set. And also, uh, as I commented before, uh, things like bits, the other stemmers cannot stem it. In, in our case, uh, yes. And also in cases like, like verbs, the Spanish stemmer, the snowball one, uh, stems it. Uh, in the other cases, like it's a, it's a verb, uh, it's, they are smart enough to do not make the, the change. Other things that happen here is uh, uh, we have caro cara, which is the feminine and, and, and masculine words. This is, they are singulars. In the case of the Spanish stemmer and the light stemmer, they stem it. In our case, since we see it's a singular, we are, we are not changing it. Uh, other example would be an invariant, like abre botellas. In this case, you should not change the word because there is no plural, no singular, and there is no common root. And in this case, we kept the, the same word. Other things, another invariant will be caries. Uh, this is toothache. And it's, it's, it's the same case. And also with plural forms in masculine and feminine, as you see, the other stemmers generate this short stem that is also non-human readable. In any one case, we are generating the correct version. And then another kind of invariant, which is a name like uh, Jueves, which is Thursday. In this case, we are not changing it. And the other stemmers, they are making the, the stem. And also another case with uh, plurals that are shorter than five terms, and with the feminine and masculine, we are able to generate the, the, correct, the correct stemming. And the other stemmers are not able to, to change the, the root. Okay, now some small general guidelines on how to use them. First, and this is really important, uh, look for weighted uh, collisions. So you can use this keyword marker filter to mark which tokens you don't want to be uh, stemmed. Stem, sorry. Uh, in this case, for example, we are making a search of this Mercedes. In this case, the t-shirts and so on is for the stemmed word for Merced. And in the other ones is Mercedes, which is a, a brand car. In this case, if we are doing the stemming and we are not uh, marking these words of something that we should not stem, you, you, should, you would see all, this, all of the results uh, mixed. 
So it will give a really bad results because you will see cars mixed with, with clothes, which is something that uh, when somebody looks for Mercedes, for sure they are not looking for this. Uh, also, and this, I think this is important, is when, when you want to use this stemming and why. In this case, the, the objective could be removing plurals, removing gender, or increase the recall at cost of precision. It could be something like when you want to see everything versus I want a specific document or type of document. So in the case of removing plurals, all the stemmers uh, work correctly. If you want to remove the gender, the Spanish stemmer and the light stemmer uh, can do that also. In our case, we don't do, we don't do it. And when you want to stem bears and related concepts, you should use the Spanish stemmer. And in the light and the plural stemmer, uh, uh, they don't stem, but you can see some, some collisions depending on, on the words. For example, there are some verbal forms that end in S that they, they will be stem because uh, uh, both algorithms are algorithmical and they don't have any kind of dictionary or any kind of ontology to see if something is a verb or something is an adjective, a noun or, or whatever. And more or less, that's all. Great presentation, Sevilla. I would say that uh, we certainly have learned some new words in Spanish. Uh, <laughs> there, however, are uh, some comments that uh, stemmers, of course, are a pretty pain point for any language. Uh, there's this um, observation that uh, Uwe has that uh, stemmers actually don't need to create real words, but they just need to normalize. And uh, I'm, I am and others are also trying to understand because uh, the words that you showcased as an example, they were completely different from the words uh, in, the, in their plural or their feminine or masculine format. So is that how it is for uh, Spanish or would you like to add something here? Well, in our case, uh, we are we are looking for generating um, correct correct um, tokens. This is to avoid collisions because if you see the the root of the word, there are lots of possibilities that another word uh, can collision with your stem, and they they are stem in in the same root. If you can generate a correct uh, token or a correct, or a correct Spanish word, these collisions are much less probable. Okay. So I guess, yeah, I think uh, Uwe probably has understood this uh, before me. And uh, he also comments the similar thing that they should not create uh, the words, should not create collision. Uh, like if there are digits at the end of the word to tell if it's masculine or feminine, it's, it's fine. So, and we have second question from Rene. Uh, what is the major cause that gives an advantage to your stemmer implementation over the other stemmers? Is it all due to uh, using better rules than other stemmers or? Uh, there are, first is uh, we have a better rules. Our rules are more complete. Uh, the, in the case of the Spanish light stemmer, their algorithm is more simple and they don't look for all, for all the cases. Also for the invariants on the special cases, we have a small list of, uh, of common invariants and common special cases. In this case, we are using a little dictionary inside. inside. Okay, and I also heard during your presentation that you're also open to uh, work with community for uh, making the existing stem better in solar. Is that correct? Yeah, well, I, our idea, and that's why we're doing the presentation, is uh, try to see if there is interest in releasing this for the community. Since we are using open source code technologies and solar and Lucene, and we have benefited from the community for a long time, we, we think it's uh, a good moment to, to provide what we have and see if there is some interest on it. Sure, I hope someone would certainly reach out to you regarding that. And I think one more comment from uh, Uwe that uh, 
I assume it's a Lucene token filter. So it works also with solar as well as with elastic search and open search. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I put it solar just because we are we are always talking about solar and make no distinct, distinction between uh, solar and Lucene, but this is this is implemented at the Lucene level. So okay. it, it could be used in any search engine that is based on Lucene. Great, super awesome. So that was a great presentation, Xavier. Thank you so much. And You're uh, welcome. I move on to our next uh, speaker. Uh, Eric Pugh, who would be talking about a quick Cupid conversation, how to talk about search quality in a structured way with colleagues. Uh, by the way, everything with Q, and I'm pretty looking forward to how is it done. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so uh, I am happy to talk about uh, a project that I've been working on, Cupid, and I'm at the beach. And so this is my vacation edition. So there's the view, uh, really glad to be here. Uh, and let me just start my timer. So, excellent. So, all right. So, uh, uh, I search probably broken, right? Uh, and, and this comic here is between my col uh, colleague that I used to work with. Eric, I can't uh, hear you. Uh, you might want to turn off your video, maybe to save bandwidth. I think we... We lost him. <laughs> yeah, we lost him, it seems like. Okay, so maybe we move on to the next talk and maybe come back to Eric later. Sure. I suggest. sure. Okay. So that was again another technology glitch. So I move on to our next speaker, um, Hamish Ogilvy. I hope I say it right. And he would speak about highly efficient dense retrieval using neutral hashes. Neural ashes, yep. One second. Okay, uh, yeah, so this talk is, it's a quick one, but just about uh, neural hashes, which is a new way of uh, doing search, kind of similar to vectors, but a little bit different. So when, uh, when we think about search, we break it down into three distinct areas, career understanding, relevance, and ranking, and they're all a little bit interrelated. Um, but really, the part that I'm talking about today is a little bit career understanding, but mostly in the, the relevance side of things. So trying to filter the results to find the, the best matches. In terms of what AI relevance is, you guys are all probably familiar with this, but it's basically just representing words and sometimes images mathematically. Um, the advantage there, when you think about keywords, keywords are quite binary. So in search, you either match or you don't. Um, so you have to use things like rules and synonyms and things like that to actually uh, get keywords and text to match uh, to produce good results. Uh, AI-based relevance instead looks at similarity. So close concepts are represented closely. And the nice thing with that is that because they're not binary, you can add, subtract them, and you can also learn. So the note at the bottom is that you can um, take data such as purchases and then feed that back in and improve relevance uh, over time. So what, like, what, like, what are hashes and why? I think the way that we think about this is that we've moved from a keyword world. A lot of the technology, even on the left, is starting to move more into a vector world. Uh, so even you know, Lucene and the uh, Elastic and Solar are adding things like approximate nearest neighbors into the index structures themselves. So they're moving into the, the vector world. The way we kind of see it is that that will then move into a world where you use hashes instead of vectors. So we think that it'll probably move to hashes before vectors really make it mainstream. And I'll show you why in a second. The reason for this is uh, there's a few reasons. Um, 
Storage size is one of the obvious ones. You use literally about 10% of the space and that's for 99% NDCG to doing a cosine um, full exhaustive vector comparison. So that like from a storage perspective, it's tiny. Uh, from a query speed perspective, it's so much faster. It's, it's kind of ridiculous. And you can also do it on standard CPUs. So instead of having to run AI models on uh, GPUs and such, you can basically do everything on CPUs. And then the other thing is that you don't need graphs and tree-based tree -based structures um, to do the approximate nearest neighbors. So the advantage there is that you can do things like inserts, deletions, edits um, of items with virtually no cost. It's very similar to posting lists. So the demo I'm about to just jump into is intentionally uses one CPU. And I do that just um, because we can, and it, it kind of shows the speed. Uh, it's an old Best Buy catalog, 25,000 products. The full index for the 25,000 products is actually only 15 meg. So it's, it's tiny, which is part of the reason that it's fast. Uh, we're doing approximate nearest neighbors, and then we're going to show how you can use um, historical or real-time learnings to actually improve the results. So what we don't do, uh, we're not doing any autocomplete suggestions or anything like that. There's no key words, tokenization, assessing. There's no rules. There's nothing. It's just a pure approximate nearest neighbors. So this, um, as I said, it's a sample uh, Best Buy index. So you can do queries like, you know, HDTV, um, SD card, digital watch. Um, so they're all, they're all relatively simple queries, but when you do things like keep my beer cold, that's a query that a lot of technology would normally choke on. Um, but here with no synonyms or anything, we've actually picked up, you want a fridge. If you want to keep your beer cold, you want a fridge. So you can ask things like questions and get answers um, without any language processing at all. And this, to run that against the Best Buy catalog with um, 25,000 products took less than one millisecond. So interesting thing here, um, you also see that we've pulled up a Ninja hot and cold tumbler. And that's something that you probably wouldn't think about keeping your beer cold in, but you can. Uh, so other queries here, I like this one, vertical vacuum, because no one would ever ask for it. Uh, no one says vertical. They all say upright. And vacuum is actually spelt wrong, but there's no spelling correction being done here. That's actually converting that into a vector. And it doesn't work for all misspellings, but it works for the, the misspellings where um, they're common. And so they're actually the ones that you want to catch, and that, that works really well. So where does this fall down? Uh, if you think the underlying model is not smart enough. And so this is an example like big TV, it's associating things with um, brackets and mounts and frames and things like that. Whereas we would probably want to associate this with big TVs. And so if I scroll down and find this one here, the Sony 65 inch, what I can actually do is click good on that. And then that's actually fed back in a learning correction over the top of the, the hashes. And so now, we can see that big TV is actually finding the correct results. And so interesting thing here is that when you do this in a practical sense, you use the query and then the, uh, the purchase history to feed this back in, but we're gonna short circuit that today just to show that um, it works. And where that gets interesting is, say you go to really big TV, um, it's showing TVs, but if I use the button up here to turn the learning off, we're back to cabinets and um, other things. And so what's actually happened here is that the learning for big TV was in close proximity to the query, really big TV. And so that learning that just that one click that we did has actually applied to the, the close, um, close match in terms of a query. So this is like really, really big TV, really, really very big TV. And you can see that it's still associating the learnings because the, the query intent is very similar. And so this is, it just, it, it gives you really interesting 
um, capabilities. So outdoor speaker like a rock. Um, these ones are like a rock, this one isn't. So I can just select some of the ones that look like a rock and they automatically move to the top. And so if you're thinking about this in an e-commerce standpoint, you put it live and then it just slowly learns what the concept of relevance is over time. So other interesting ones, coffee gift card, never mentions coffee, but it knows Starbucks is related. Caffeine still knows that, that that's related. And so you're seeing interesting things here where you're seeing some things related to coffee and caffeine and some things relating to gift card. And that's because you've got mixed intent in the queries. So the goal here is that you can learn uh, globally, but you can also learn locally for the user. So if that particular user is not interested in coffee makers, for instance, you can get rid of that. And now you can see it's locked on to more of the gift card uh, context. And so in, a, in a, a real world scenario, you can actually learn with the user as they browse through and, uh, and search the site. So yeah, that's just a quick demo, but um, yeah, it's very powerful in, in what you can do. That's all. Okay, that was pretty cool. I would say, I mean, despite it's on the old data set, as you mentioned, but looks pretty nice. Uh, yeah. I don't know, maybe I observed that the, the results in some of the cases were not quite relevant. Yeah. Uh, maybe I might have noticed this. I think some of the other uh, viewers are also uh, mentioning that. However, yeah. in this, we do have one question for you uh, from Roy saying, how rigid is the search? addition and removal of random words will lead to different search result pages or? Yeah, so it's, it's pretty insensitive to things like that because it's really looking at, it's turning the, the query into a vector. So the order of the words is important. And if you do have junk in there, it does take it into account, but quite often you find that it doesn't have a massive impact. Mm -hmm. It's pretty, it's pretty insensitive. Yeah. Okay. And um, I mean, I'm just curious about as to if this was to put live, I mean, uh, so you would use these judgments uh, to be used in the uh, live system, right? Yep. yep. Okay. Cool. You I can, and, and so this, this is just at the moment, it's using the raw, um, AI model stuff underneath. So there's no learning applied on top of that. Mm -hmm. And so because this is using it, it's built on top of the um, Google's universal sentence encoder, one of one of those models. And so it converts the vectors into hashes and then the entire index is done in hashes. And so that universal sentence encoder was trained on Wikipedia or uh, things like that. So when you look at things like e-commerce search, if you don't use learnings, then you're starting with something that's not going to be quite relevant for e-commerce search, but the advantage is that it's multilingual, uh, that, that works in about 16 languages, it's very fast. And wow. when, when you start to add the learning on top of that, you can move the, um, the proximity of the relevance to the, to the correct mm -hmm. locations relatively easily. Yeah. yeah, pretty interesting. We have one more question for you, meanwhile, that uh, from Uwe that how are the hashes searched? Yeah, um, it's a good question. Could probably do a full talk on that. There's this demo just shows here, there's um, there's five uh, of the top activated neurons there. So basically you, you look when you're creating the, the hashes, you create the hashes with a neural network and you also record the neurons at the last phase in the um, network that were most activated. And when you do that, you can basically create a posting list off the, the final neurons, essentially. And so in this case, I'm searching on the most top five activated neurons, and then I'm reading the, the hashes and doing a comparison against the query. So it's kind of a, a two-phase thing, but if you do a different, um, like drip, for instance, you'd see that these would have changed. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I guess that must have answered the questions and that was a pretty interesting talk. Thank you so much, Hamish. Uh, we would like to no, make- 
we, we would like to make Eric come back with a better internet connection this time. So yeah, that was, uh, that was terrifying. All of a sudden you guys disappeared. I was like, where is everybody? So, all right. So let's try that again in uh, eight minutes since, uh, since I already did sort of the first two minutes. So, um, so here we go, right? So we were talking a little bit about before I disappeared, why is your search broken? And the reason is we're having a conversation between typically an expert and an engineer, right? And the expert, whoever is the person who's sort of defining what is good search, often is embedding a lot of their own knowledge into their expectations for what is search, right? So Rena, of course, knows that myocardial infarction means the same thing as heart attacks, but nobody else knows that who is not a medical professional, right? That's not how normal people work. And then we know, you know, we've seen this pattern plenty of times, which is where somebody fixes one search problem, myocardial, whatever, and then they break something else, right? And we start playing this whack-a-mole game of I fix one thing and something else breaks. Um, and so that process goes on and on. And, you know, I think it sort of sum it up in a lot of situations where we're trying to improve the quality of our search, you know, we've talked in this conference a couple of times, you should work with your subject matter experts, you work with your audience, but the reality is collaborating with other people is difficult and there's no real support for it. Testing is hard, right? What is good, good search results? You know, as small things moving around can have a really big impact. And that leads to iteration being very slow. So that was the genesis of Cupid, uh, which is a tool to have a conversation with people about the quality of your search and then iterate and play with it. And so I'm just going to go ahead and bring it up and show it to you all. So, so here I'm logged into Cupid, and I'm actually going to go ahead and quickly create a case, right, and uh, my EC's demo. Uh, everybody see this? This is all live. I can play, you know, I'm just going to point at my solar or elastic search. And, you know, it gives us an idea of what are the fields that we want to look at. Uh, I'm also going to, I'm going to add a, a vote count field and a vote average field. So go ahead, grab those. And then I'm going to go ahead and, you know, my kids have been making me watch lots of Star Wars while we're on vacation. So I'll go ahead and bring up that query. So here we go. We're logged into Cupid. And the idea behind Cupid here is it lets me look at the quality of my search results. But I'm doing it in sort of a structured way. How many of us have all heard the feedback, search sucks? Right. And that's what somebody gives you. And you're like, well, what does that mean? Can we put a number on it? Can you give me specific examples? If you're lucky, maybe you get back a long spreadsheet or a bunch of screenshots of why it's bad. Uh, so Cupid here is all about looking at the quality of search. And in a perfect world, right, I would be sitting with a subject matter expert and saying, well, are these good documents or not? So I have simple Star Wars. If I'm looking for a movie to watch, uh, am I interested in interviews with the cast of all the Star Wars films and inside info? I mean, as a software developer, I'd be like, well, it matches. I got a link. It's working. But we know that that's not a good result. What about the story of the Star Wars toys? Is that what people are looking for? No. What about even a fan fiction remake? No. And all of a sudden we start realizing, you know, we have 2,477 results that are currently matching. And so right here, I can quickly go through and start saying, are these good search results or not? Here's one. The Clone Wars, that was actually a pretty good TV show. So I'm going to go ahead and give it a one. Now, again, I might be sitting with someone and want to have a discussion about why is the Clone Wars a good result, whereas these other documentaries, et cetera, are bad results. But what this does is lets me have a real conversation about, wow, yes, these search results are terrible. And then... You know, what I love about using a tool like Cupid is I can go ahead and I can sit 
right there with my subject matter experts and say, well, is there anything we could do? What can we do to improve it? Like, well, that's interesting. Some of these have pretty low vote counts. Let me go ahead and boost on, like, maybe let me get more votes. Def I equals e dismax. And I'm going to boost function equals vote count. And let's see if this is better search results. Got to move the zoom window around, rerun my searches. Hey, look at that. The Force Awakens, is that a good movie result? I'd say so, right? Everybody's like, ah, there it is, right? There is the movie that we all remember. There we go. The Truman Show, why is that showing up? You know, definitely a stinker in there. But you can see, just based on heavily biasing on vote count, I can show that. Now, maybe I'm sitting with my subject matter expert and they're asking me, why am I getting back? Why did the Truman show up? Does Truman show show up? Well, you know, Cupid lets me start showing like some of the math, but without getting such in the weeds that someone's terrified. You can see that in this algorithm, I am heavily biased towards the vote count that's you know directly affecting. And so anything that matches is going to be summed up by the vote count. So um, yeah, so this is kind of Cupid in a nutshell. Uh, we can do some other things like we can toggle some notes. you know what you know I'll often put what my information need is. I am looking for one of the major block major motion pictures or the new TV shows like Mandalorian, right? Could write that right there. I could save that and then I can share that with the next person. I could take one of these and I can share it with a bunch of teams. Right, and so there's a whole bunch of teams I have there, so I can go ahead and share it with my other colleagues. There we go. And now they get access to the same URL and they can rate documents, they can look at them, they can say, well, why, you know, what were you looking for in Star Wars? Oh, this is what was going on. So yeah, so that's Cupid in a real quick nutshell. Um, so uh, brief history of Cupid, it's been around since 2013. So we've been using it for a really long time. We used it before we even knew what NDCG and average precision were as metrics. We had our own homegrown metrics that were pretty awful. Um, lots of people are using it and uh, we're releasing lots uh, constantly. And then lastly, if you're wondering why is it called Cupid? It's because it's to show your queries some love. Thank you. Super interesting. I think last one was my question. You already stole my question. <laughs> because I was I was pretty, pretty um, inquisitive as to why everything starts with Q and why um, such a name, Cupid. Yeah, yeah. It's because we need a way to show our queries some love, make them better. Cool. And we have one more question from David Harris. Uh, how does Cupid handle conflicting judgments from multiple reviewers? Ah, that is a wonderful question. And the answer is today it does not. However, uh, today uh, when I rate these documents, this is a shared space. However, if you watch the uh, London Information Retrieval Meetup yesterday, I showed that uh, we actually have a branch out right now, uh, which is all about multiple raters. Um, it's inspired by the uh, Discernitron project from the Wikimedia Foundation. And I don't think I have any good screenshots in here, but we're actually starting to support multiple raters and we're calculating um, some little bubbles uh, that tell you um, how accurate, how, how aligned your users are. So uh, 
let's see, PR. Uh, uh, if I get lucky, 263. Resume share. So this is a demo version of the application. And we're actually starting to support multiple raters judging independently. And we're doing some basic math. So like this one here, everybody agreed. This one, there was some dispute, uh, some that there's a lot. So that's a feature that's coming soon to Qubit. Super impressive, I must say. That was really great, especially, I mean, the changes from uh, where I attended the last workshop, it, it certainly looks pretty advanced from there. We're getting there, we're getting there. So thank sure. you. Wishing you all the luck. Okay, so I guess that was the last question, but at this point in time, thank you so much uh, for your presentation, Eric, once again, and from uh, everyone. everyone